Oh, hello. Welcome to uh, my long foretold faction rundown for the Hand of the Archon uh, settling. This should be quite in-depth and quite long because I have been noodling this video for quite a long time. This is the new Dark Eldar kill team. So, um, the Hand of the Archon. Let's have a look at them. So, first thing to notice is that they've got all three of the good archetypes, if we're referring to the new... Uh, critical operations um, pack so you've got whatever set of cards you prefer to use you can choose to use them really really strong uh, let's have a look at the operatives so we start out with our arch cyberite who's our leader now there's loads of loadouts for the arch cyberite blast pistol venom blade splinter pistol venom blade splinter pistol agonizer splinter pistol power weapon splinter rifle array of blades so I know that a lot of people who are watching this will just want to know how they're going to build their models. Almost every game, I would say 90% of games, you're going to want to take your Blast Pistol and your Venom Blade. I do think there's an argument for subbing in the Agonizer and Splinter Pistol versus Harlequins. We'll talk more, of that, more about that when we review the Arch Sybarites card. Uh, then you have eight other operatives. So it's a nine-man team. And as I said in my model review video, you get 10 models, so you get to build one spare one. Uh, so, for your eight other models, you essentially have to take all the specialists plus one basic... Uh, they call it a cabalized agent. It's the basic trooper model, right? So, your only other choices come in the form of your gunners. So, for the cabalite gunner, you have the choice of the blaster or the shredder. And again, we'll talk about this more when we review the gunner's data card... Generally speaking, you want the Blaster. Uh, the Shredder, though, has play uh, against, say, a 7 wound team on Into the Dark. You might well want the Shredder. And then the Heavy Gun is really interesting. So the Heavy Gunner has two options, a Dark Lance and a Splinter Cannon. Build the Splinter Cannon. I actually can't see ever taking the Dark Lance because of this rule here. So let me just get the laser pointer for you. Uh, your kill team can only include up to two Dark Light weapons. Blast Pistol, Blaster, and Dark Lance. So you can't include all those three. And I've already said that most of the time you want a Blast Pistol. And most of the time you want um, a, a, a Blaster. So therefore it's the Dark Lance that you'll be leaving at home. Now I know I've given you scenarios for times that you wouldn't necessarily want the Blast Pistol. Or you wouldn't necessarily want the Blaster. And you might be thinking, well in those situations, maybe I'll take a Dark Lance. The thing is, those situations are situations where you either can't use against Harlequins your AP, or you're fighting against a team where the AP is not particularly useful, someone like Vetguard. That's not the situation when you suddenly want to flex from your uh, Splinter Cannon into the Darklands. So I really don't think you're going to use the Darklands, um, but again, we'll talk about it more when we get to the Heavy Gunner card. So let's get started with... Oh no, hang on. First we've got to look at Power from Pain. So Power from Pain is the ability for the Hand of the Archon team. Um, it says here, Each time a friendly Hand of the Archon operative incapacitates an enemy operative with a wounds characteristic of 5 or more, it gains a Pain token. If that enemy operative had a wounds characteristic of 11 or more, it gains 2 Pain tokens instead. So what this means is if you kill something that isn't a little tiny critter, you get a Pain token. And if you kill a Space Marine sort of thing, you get 2 Pain tokens. Pain tokens uh, stick to the operative, so they're going to be annoying to track. You can't just get a big D20 to track all your pain tokens like you would track faith points. They need to be tracked per model, so how would you do it? Let me know in the comments. I'm thinking maybe little glass beads or like little tiny dice of a kind that you're definitely not accidentally going to pick up and roll. Uh, the problem I have is when people are unprepared for things like this and they start tracking their... like resources with just some dice that also are the dice they're rolling and then inevitably some dice get picked up and rolled like this happened to me at last Warhammer world tournament a guy picked up and rolled or totally by accident he picked up and rolled a wound dice and it's like well now we will never know uh but there you go so you can spend your friendly officers pain tokens on the invigorations opposite that's here uh when the the various condition is met um and with the exception of stimulated senses you can only do it once per activation so, let's look at these. Uh, there's this one here, Dark Animus, which is basically a free dash straight after the kill. So you kill somebody... Uh, no, sorry, that's Vitalized Surge we're looking at first. We're not doing it in order. 
uh, a free dash after the kill. So you kill somebody, you get your pain token, and you can then actually immediately spend it on a free dash. Now, Zimbad seems to think this is the main way that you will use it. And, you know, Zimbad is much better at kill team than me. But I, I personally can't see it. Um, it has weird anti-synergy, so... Uh, Dark Elder have a fleet of foot ploy that lets you get your free dash uh, when you move. So you're going to move move with a dash and then probably and then probably shoot somebody. Um, and then you've already dashed, so you can't do another free dash. Because remember, basic rules, even though it's free, it still counts as your dash action that you're allowed to do in that turn. Uh, but if you get a kill in combat, so you've done a charge... And then you, obviously you couldn't have dashed even if fleet was active because it doesn't chain with charge. So you can charge, fight, if you kill somebody, then maybe you can dash away around a corner. I, I can sort of see it. I think you're more likely to use it myself for Dark Animus. So Dark Animus is plus one APL. So if you kill somebody, you get your little power from pain token. And then going into the next turn, you have uh, you can spend it to start your activation with three APL. Uh, an extra APL is always useful for things like doors or um, tapping objectives, mission actions. Um, you know, there's all kinds of different mission actions that you can find yourself doing. And this way, you can do a mission action and still move and shoot. Or if there are no mission actions that you want to do, you can always do one of my favourite things, which is where you manage to charge, kill somebody in combat, and then shoot their mate, right? So I think it's going to be used quite a lot to get yourself up to 3 APL. Um, obviously... In some games, you won't get very many powerful pain tokens. If you're playing against an elite team and you're not killing them that quickly, in other games, you might have loads of them knocking around. But this is what I would assume you would use it for. And then Stimulated Senses is the last one. Uh, I, it's kind of mech to re-roll, and spending resources for re-rolls is always like, well, I'm spending something which might end up to do absolutely nothing. So I've lost a resource and achieved nothing because it's a re-roll. Um, but if you're in combat, the nice thing about re-rolling dice in combat is that you can see your dice... You can see your opponent's dice, you can do all the maths, and then you can decide, oh, well, actually, I might spend a, a power from pain token to re-roll this dice. Um, the other nice thing is stimulation from sentences is it's spammable. So, yes, you can't re-roll a dice that you've already re-rolled, but you can re-roll more than one dice if you have the pain tokens. Um, so that can really tilt a combat in your advantage, which is pretty cool. And certainly, if you're going to die, and you're going to die with pain, you might have wanted to use them for 3 APL, but if you're going to die in a combat with pain tokens, then you're going to use them before you die, because when you're dead, you can't use your pain tokens. So, I think it's a cool mechanic. Uh, yeah. It, it's a bit kind of unreliable in terms of you can't be sure ever that you're definitely going to kill somebody, so you can't really be like, I'll move here, I'll kill him, and then I'll dash out the way, because... If you don't kill him, then you're stood in the open. So I think you always have to assume, like, well, if I don't kill him, I can't dash out the way, and therefore, what am I going to do, right? Right, let's get into the data cards. So we'll start with the Arch Cyberite. So huge array of weapons. Let's try and remember um, what the, the loadouts were. So if you want the Blast Pistol, which is the four dice hitting on three, four, five damage range, red, AP2 pistol you must take the venom blade which is four dice hit on twos four four lethal four up you know it's not a bad weapon like it's the it's the new worst weapon that they invented and put on the accessory sprue to try and balance out the fact the blast pistol is so good it's not actually a bad weapon right because it's four le everything's crit so they're already saving with crits it's pretty good um, and I think against almost all opponents, that's what you take. Against Harlequins, I would swap for a Splinter Pistol and an Agonizer. Um, you know, you've got the Agonizer and the Power Weapon. The Power Weapon does have an extra point of normal damage. Uh, the Agonizer trades a point of normal damage for Brutal and Reap 1. Uh, but if you look at the damage thresholds against uh, Clowns with the Agonizer, 6, a, a crit and a hit will do 9, which will kill any Harlequin. Uh, the power weapon, you know, will do 10, which you don't require to kill a Harlequin. Your Venom Blade will do, uh, with a crit and a hit, or two crits, will do 8, which will not kill the, the boss Harlequins. So damage-wise, it doesn't make that much of a difference, but you're taking the Agonizer, I think, for the Brutal, which means that you're far more likely to get your... Um, to get your stuff through, especially against a team like Harlequins, where they're rolling lots of dice and they have lots of parries. 
So, I think there might be other situations where you use the Agonizer and the Splinter Pistol, but Harlequins are certainly the one that jump out into my brain uh, as, as being the thing that you want to try and do. If you can think of another time that you wouldn't, another team or another occasion where you wouldn't use the Blast Pistol, do let me know in the comments. I'd be really interested to hear that. Now, in terms of abilities, he has a really interesting ability down here called Cunning. So, in the play strategic deploy step of each strategy phase, if you pass at the first opportunity, you gain 1 CP. Now, a lot of people have read this as being like, well, if you don't play any strategic deploys, you can have a CP back. So, it's useful for, like, if you have run out of uh, CP towards the end of the game and you can't play in strat ploys, so you can have an extra CP on turn 3, then in turn 4, you've got 2 CP to try and, and do something with. Actually, it's much, much more interesting than that. So, the problem is, a lot of people, when they play, and I'm guilty of this, the strategic ploys step ends up being played very loosely. Like, a lot of games we forget to do it, right? You go into turn two, and somebody's really jazzed, and they start activating, and then you have to be like, oh, hang on, hang on, hang on, strat ploys, and then they kind of go, oh, well, I play, I, I, I'd have played Bolter Discipline and this other thing, and I, I played this one and this one, and you, you kind of fudge through it. For the Dark Elder, really need to tighten up the strategic ploy phase and run it how it's supposed to run in the rulebook. So the player who is going first declares if they want to use one particular strategic ploy, then the other player declares, and then they declare, and the other player declares. Now, the phase only ends um, when both players pass consecutively. So what this means is if you are the Dark Elder and you're the attacker... If you're pretty sure your opponent wants to do some strategic ploy in turn one, right, then you can go, well, I use cunning, so I, I, I pass in for my first opportunity, I gain a CP. The onus is now on them. If they pass and forego um, any of their strat ploys, then yes, they can totally end the, uh, they can totally end the, the phase. Okay? But, they haven't used any of their strat ploys. If they use a strat ploy, if they go, well, I'm going to do Bolter Discipline, then you can then come back in and start going, well, I want to use Fleet, and I want to use this, and I want to use that. Okay? So quite a lot of the time, when you're going first, you can get a CP, right? And they, um, and they will let you play the rest of your strat ploys because they won't want to pass. They'll want to get off on what most teams want to play a strategic ploy every turn. Right now, if you're going second, they play the strategic ploy they really want. You pass at your first opportunity. They've already got one strat ploy out, right? So now that when they're responding to you, it's in my view, it's more likely. Obviously, it depends on the team you're against and what their strat ploys are like. But in my view, it's now more likely that they're going to go okay pass to deny you getting any strategic ploys out. So. Bear that in mind, it's an interesting little mini-game. It's an interesting kind of mind game thing. Um, I really like it. I don't think you necessarily want to use cunning every single turn because you'll know the board state and you'll know how clutch your various strategic ploys are going to be for you. And you know if you use cunning, you open up this risk of your opponent shutting you down. But on the other hand, you know if they've been using a strat ploy every single turn, you go cunning and then at least they have to think about it. Oh, do I, do I play that, allowing them to play another strat ploy? Or do I, do, I, do I not play it and shut it down for them? Now, when these guys are still pretty new... So I think at first, you're going to be like, I play Cunning and gain a CP, and it's going to be white noise to your opponent, and your opponent's just going to autopilot into playing whatever strat ploy they were going to play, and you're going to rub evil little hands together and go, great, good, and then you're going to sail into whatever strat ploys you were going to play, because no one has explained the nuance to your opponents of, well, actually, if you engage with this mechanic, you know, you make me have a cost to get in my free CP. If they don't engage with it, then you're just getting a free CP each time. So, really interesting. Much less interesting is take aim. It's a bonus if you take a splinter rifle. You're never going to take a splinter rifle on your arch sybarite. We'll move on with our lives. To the Cabalized Agent. So, the Cabalized Agent is a basic, Billy basic guy. Um, so, I didn't cover the stats on the previous one. Your Dark Eldar is your standard move 3, APL 2, GA 1, death 3, with a 4 up save and 8 wounds, and the leader had 9 wounds. The Agent, who's your Billy basic trooper, but you are forced to take one, Splinter Rifle, 4 dice, hitting off 3s, 2, 4, lethal 5 up, not bad. Uh, 
you've got take aim so until the end of the activation the splinter rifle the operative is equipped with gains the balance special rule you can't perform it while within blue of an enemy operative fine but i don't think you're going to be trying to hold your basic guy with a splinter rifle back as some kind of ertzat sniper i think you're going to run him forward like a maniac you're going to be trying to bait out useful operatives on your opponent's side um he may be carrying a grenade and you want to run him up with that grenade or you'll be running forward to try and like d d stand on a, a point in the open and, and tap it or loot it and then you'll be like oh no my basic agent got shot like i don't think you're going to be hiding him somewhere and being like well i'm going to take aim and then i'm going to fire my splinter rifle i don't think that's the use but the action is there it's worth knowing about it might come up all these things that you say aren't very good and then you get to like the bottom of turn three and suddenly that rule that you really dismissed is really useful because that's the only guy you have left and you've got to squeeze out every little bit that you can so the crimson duelist so our first uh, combat specialist or our second combat specialist if you count the leader as a combat specialist uh, the crimson duelist has a splinter pistol and a razor flail so the razor flail rolls four dice hits on twos four five damage brutal love to see it and a new rule called flail so a couple of rules brutal display which is mental uh each time you incapacitate an enemy operative in combat select one other enemy operative visible to and within red of this operative or the incapacitated enemy operative until the start of this next turning point that other enemy operative cannot perform mission actions or the pickup action or control objective markers so if you have, let me just sketch out a situation, you had two marines on an objective, if you charge and kill one, you can then turn off the other marines' control of that objective marker, and now you control the objective marker, even though you've only got two APL, and there's a marine stood on the objective, because he watched you kill his mate, and he was so horrified, he forgot how to control objective markers, which is pretty good. Um, that's pretty good. Right, she's going to be really good for rushing in and really disrupting your opponent's primary scoring plans. She has the flail attack, so when you're fighting combat with the weapon and the result is going to hit step of the combat, you can, if you parry, you parry away two of your opponent's successful hits. And you also have Crimson Assault, which means you can perform a free fight action, and then if you complete the sequence and you're still in engagement range of an enemy operative, you can do a second fight action. You do not have to set the same target. Now, I'm sure I don't have to explain to you how these two things synergize with each other, right? Because you're no longer having to try and kill the person in one round of fighting. You're going to get a round of fighting where you strike first, and then you're going to get another round of fighting where you strike first. So you can parry, right? You can parry, perhaps parry twice, so they just can't hit you with anything, and then do a little bit of damage, and then come in with the next fight action, knowing that you're going to get a crit, probably, and then you're going to get another set of damage. And as long as you reckon you can kill them over the, over the course of two fight actions, you can play quite defensively and parry away loads of their dice, um, is how you, you would play with, with, with this. And that, that is really cool. I, I think it's a really cool model. Um, you know, eight wounds base... And then with that extra survivability from being able to parry so much is, is pretty, pretty good. Um, now, it's worth saying that you can give her the Toxin Coating. So for 2 EP, you can give her weapon, uh, her Razor Flail, Lethal 5 Plus. Uh, I don't know. Um, it's not so vital because the weapon already has Brutal. So... Part of the benefit of getting a crit is that it can only be parried by a crit. Well, all your wep all your things, they're not all crits, but they can all only be parried by crits. So what we're actually looking, for, what we're actually getting here is an increased chance of, of doing an extra point of damage. Is that worth two equipment points for you? We're going to explore that more on the equipment slide, okay? But it's worth thinking about whether that's something that you want to do. The Flayer, the second combat specialist, or third if you count the leader. So he hits on threes, not twos, but he's relentless, so he's hitting on threes with re-rolls, which is still very good. Um, he has an ability called uh, uh, Insensible to Pain, so he just gets minus one damage across the board. Amazing, right? Amazing. So he's pretty tanky as it goes, 
Okay. Uh, his thing with Flay is that he generates uh, when he fights in combat. When you resolve with a crit, select one friendly hand of the Archon operative within red of this operative to gain a pain token. So you can just spew out extra pain tokens around into your team. That's pretty good. On this guy, I feel that Toxic Coating is 100% mandatory because unlike the Razor Flails, like the Razor Flails were 4-5, this is 3-5, so there's a two-step damage difference between the normal and the crit. There's no Brutal, so the crits are also harder for your opponent to get rid of. And when you get a crit, I mean, granted it's only the... Um, the first time you get a crit but you really want to get a crit so you can spaff out those additional um power from pain tokens so i think 2 ep for a toxin coating for the cab light flare is like the most mandatory piece of war gear uh in in the list you, you always want to do that um notice he doesn't have a ranged weapon which is interesting so the other the 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 witch uh the crimson duelist i should say had a splinter pistol this guy, no ranged weapon, your mileage may vary. With that, maybe you want to give him a grenade. Uh, I, I don't know, right? But that's pretty cool. Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's cool and he's survivable. And there's all kinds of ploys and things that make him even more synergistic as well. Gunners. So uh, we'll talk about the gunner. Again, you've got a choice between a blaster and a shredder. So the blaster is four dice, hitting on three is five, six, AP two. It's a very, very good gun. You know, five, six, AP two, infinite range, and it's not got gets hot. Really, really good. Really, really good. Now, sometimes you might want to swap that out for a shredder against uh, a horde team. You know, because the Shredder is five dice, hitting on three, three, four, blast and rending. Now, in Into the Dark, it gets a lethal five up. And also in Into the Dark, just mechanically, against like a 10 or 11 man team, there's going to be more situations where they're within um circle of each other just because of how the rooms are on Into the Dark and how claustrophobic it is. So potentially, the Shredder is something that you want to swap in against horde teams on into the dark or potentially just against horde teams regardless of what you're playing on but have the option in your toolbox but the blaster is a great gun and it's a great opportunity cost if you're giving up your blaster so bear that in mind i would always build the blaster and have it as your primary pick although honestly if you've got the box the extra model the first extra model i would build for this team the most useful kind of one to swap around with would be a shredder right as your alternative model because i think that is the the deviation from the take all comers list that it has the most impact right and your heavy gunner so the heavy gunner has a choice between a dark lance uh four dice hitting on three six seven ap2 heavy unwieldy though uh, the splinter cannon five dice hitting on three three five fuselide pointless heavy and lethal five up now the Splinter Cannon is your pick because of the Dark Light rule I explained. Um, and as I said, I just don't think you're ever going to use the Dark Lance. Right. It's worth noting as well, unwieldy means that you can't overwatch, which in turn means you can go, can't go on guard in uh, ultra-close confines. You can go on guard, but you can't take the overwatch shot that the guard action would allow you to take because you've got an unwieldy weapon. So yes, you can spend the AP and go, I'm on guard, technically... Te technically but then <laughs> you can't do anything with it so you can't go on guard uh, effectively right uh de facto you you cannot go on guard if yeah uh yes I mean, someone will go in the comments and go oh, technically you know du jour yes you, you can go on guard with with the dark lance i guarantee it but no um you can also buy a base damage now it's going to be three ep for your splinter cannon to take it from 3.5 to 4.5. I don't know if that's worthwhile or not. Like, that's a really hard one. Because it's 3 EP for a point of base damage. But, but, it might make all the difference. Because you are rolling 5 dice. And I've got lethal 5 up, yes. But you are rolling 5 dice. You're going to get some normals. We'll talk about it on the equipment page. Just file it in your brains as a thing that exists in the world. 
the disciple of Yelandra. Now, this is an obscure bit of lore that they mind. I love this. This is also a massive data sheet. So she's got two things, and they're kind of at odds with each other because they're both shooting attacks at range red. So that's a lie. The Torment Grenade is not a shooting attack. So if you start within range red of somebody, you could technically do a Stinger Pistol and a Torment Grenade. I just lied. But potentially you're going to want to move. But of course, if you have a Power from Pain token, right? Hard for it to get because she's not very killy. But if you had a Power from Pain token, 3 APL, you could move through your grenade and uh, shoot your Stinger Pistol just a thought now maybe you've got that third apl that power from pain token by hanging out next to your friendly flare right and your friendly neighborhood flare has gone i'm flaying the skin and you've gone i really like the way you're flaying the skin and you've gained a power from pain token just from observing the skin flaying potentially um the stinger pistol is a weird thing so you roll five dice right and then you ignore the rule book right so you roll five dice uh, each time the operator makes shooting attack with this weapon in the roll attack dice step of that shooting attack, attack dice results, excluding one, that are less than the target's save characteristic, inflict one mortal wound on the target. Attack dice results of one inflict three mortal wounds on the target instead. At the end of the roll attack dice step, the shooting attack ends, no defense dice are rolled, and no further damage is inflicted. It's the target's save characteristic, not the invulnerable save. So you roll your five dice. You look at your opponent's armor save. Let's say they've got a four up save. You've rolled your five dice. Your twos and threes do one mortal wound each. And your ones do three mortal wounds each. Right? This machine kills space clowns. Because space clowns have a six up regular armor save that they never use. But it doesn't use their invulnerable save. So against space clowns, you roll your five dice, you discard your sixes, you do three mortal wounds with each of your one, and all your other dice do one mortal wound each, and then you kill the space clown, and then you laugh because you're the better Eldar team. Um, I don't know why they gave the Dark Eldar a Harlequin killing gun, but they have given them a Harlequin destroying gun that destroys Harlequins. And... Sangors, but it destroys harlequins also it doesn't just kill it then explodes so each time an enemy operative is incapacitated by this weapon before it's removed each operative not each enemy operative don't frag your own guy each operative visible to and within white of it suffers d3 mortal wounds each operative subsequently incapacitated as a result of this special rule will cause this to happen again if you actually get the golden situation where you've got an enemy guy, some enemy guys in a big cluster, and you kill one, and then one of the other ones that you've killed has few enough wounds that you could potentially kill them with D3 mortals, then that's just funny. It's never going to happen, but if it does happen, it's pretty funny. Um, and then you've got the Torment Grenade, which is more, I would suggest, what this model is about, right? So, one action point, you select... A, it's not a shooting attack. It just sounds a lot like a shooting attack, but it's not a shooting attack. You select one point in the kill zone within red of the operative, and you roll a d6 for each other operative within white of that point. For each roll, you add one if the save characteristic is 4 plus or worse, and you subtract one if that operative is not visible to this operative. On a 3+, plus, that other operative is poisoned until the end of the battle... Uh, it takes two mortal wounds, uh, and it's treated as being injured, regardless of any rules that says it can't be injured, even if it's a plague marine. Um, now, this model upsets me a little bit, because it's so good against not space marines, and then against space marines, it becomes both its weapons go, oh, you've got a decent armor save, I'll just become much less effective, which is quite sad. Right, but... Then again, it's still got a 50% chance of poisoning a space marine and injuring a space and making a space marine permanently injured is pretty funny. Like, it's pretty funny. Especially if it was a plague marine, but it's pretty funny. Uh, you know, I think the 
this is going to be a hard model to use. Uh, the This is one of the things, like, you know, I was playing recently with my Star Striders, and everybody now knows about the Star Striders off-board strikes, and so your opponents are being really, really diligent about placing their models and keeping them all apart. And So this is going to be another one of those where I think... It, <laughs> Your opponent's gonna have to be quite they have to quite seriously misplay for you to actually get the 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 Hail Mary, I've thrown the grenade, and actually like five of your guys are just injured for the rest of the game and just dying and wasting away. But even if you do it to one model, it's still pretty good if it's a, a key model that your opponent really doesn't want to be injured, because there's nothing they can do. There's nothing they can do to ever remove that injury. It's just there for the rest of the game. Deal with it. Even if you kill the Disciple, it's still there. The Elix Elixiant, who is excellent. Um, so, <laughs> he has combat drugs. If this operative is selected for deployment, select one of the following abilities for the friendly hand of the Archon operatives to gain until the end of the battle. Painbringer. Each time the operative would lose a wound as a result of an attack dice that inflicts damage, roll 1d6. On a 6, the wound is not lost. Or Hypex. Add black to the operative's movement characteristic. Now, this is really, really, really interesting and really, really, really debatable because what we have here is two really good buffs and a genuine choice. So, six up, feel no pain is really, really swingy. And your gut reaction might be to say, well, six up, feel no pain might do nothing all game, whereas an extra inch of movement is an extra inch of movement that I can have and hold and take to the back. However... I would like to argue that actually the psychological effect of a 6 up feel no pain is really, really helpful. Because the nice thing about a feel no pain type saves in Kill Team is that you can take them in combat, where normally everyone's mitigation is just more or less turned off. So now people are charging you in combat. Maybe they've got a weapon that on a crit does 8 damage. Right. And maybe they haven't got very many wounds left. And they're just going to be like, well, I'll charge. As long as I get a crit, I'll kill him. And then I'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be able to I'll be able to do whatever I want to do. If your entire team has feel no pain on a six up, suddenly that is a lot of a, that is a shaky proposition. Because now it's like, well, if I get a crit, I'll kill him. No, if I get a crit, he'll roll eight dice. Chances are one of those dice will come up six. And then... They'll hit me back, right? And we've all been in those games where you've had somebody who's on, like, a few wounds and they charge and they, they know, oh, I'll just get one crit, and they do it, and it's great, and it's good, and that's how charging in combat works. And this just throws the maths off in a delicious little way that on a team with two slash three really good combat models, I find particularly delicious. That said, I can't downplay the benefit of an extra inch of movement, right? It, it's really, really good. And it will help you board control. It will potentially help you score objectives. It will get you more points. And points mean wins. I'm going to start off with the, uh, the, the pain bringer. I may swap to the Hypex to see what the difference is. We shall see. Now... What else does he do? He brings this at the start of the game. What does he actually do when he runs around? The first thing he does is he has a splinter rifle. So unlike most kind of medics or things like that in the game, he's not running around with the last pistol all game going, oh, I can't really do anything. He has the same gun as your Billy Basic guy, which is great. He also has his stim needler. I really don't rate weapons like this. They keep giving us these really short-range stun gun things. Uh, I'm, I'm never going to use it, I don't think. Right, uh, range blue. Uh, what even is range blue? <sighs> Administer drug. Oh, sorry. Administer drug. So you can heal people. You can't revive. So you're like half a medic. You can put blood back in, though. You know, you revive. You re help them regain D3 plus 1 lost wounds, which is nice, but you can't do the resurrection thing that most medics have. Okay? You can also swap out somebody's combat drugs ability. So potentially. You could um, give everybody the plus one inch of movement, start this guy next to one of your combat specialists, and one of your first activations of the game, you know, everyone likes to do a little procedural activation right at the start because they're trying to wear their opponent down, make them make the first mistake, right? So as your little procedural activation at the start of the game, you could swap 
uh, one of your combat guys over to the six up, feel no pain, and then like walk over there next to somebody else or something like that. Uh, I just think it's too fiddly to be useful. I just think it's too fiddly to be useful, and actually what he's going to do is spend his days running around a bit, trying to put blood back into people and probably die. Like, I, he brings a really powerful ability and he's worth taking, but then I think, actually, in the game? Eh. Maybe I'm underselling him, because I'm not very good at kill team. Maybe it is actually all about sending your, sending your whole team to one combat drugs buff, and then starting the game and putting someone else on a second combat drugs buff but it replaces it's not an addition to it replaces right if it was an addition to that would absolutely be the play and it would be like yes i'm going to give my combat guy plus one inch to them you know to their move as well as uh feel no pain but no, alas no the sky splinter assassin last one sky splinter assassin has a lot of things going on so <sighs> has this omen ability so much like the um much like the uh elixir that we just looked at he does something even before the game really starts so in the select equipment step you can select one enemy operative or one of the friendly hand of the archon operative reveal your selection when you reveal equipment each time attack or defense dice roll for that operative either if it's an enemy operative you must re-roll all dice results of six if it's a friendly operative you can re-roll all dice results of one Use this on an enemy operative most of the time, surely. Like, if you're playing against a team where they've got a model that really likes crits, you know, like a sniper, like the guard sniper that's like 3-3 three, three damage and then mortal wounds 3 on a crit, and you just go, no, if you roll the hard 6, you can re-roll the 6, right? Amazing. If, if, if the team you're playing against really doesn't have any operatives like that, then... Maybe that you can consider giving the re-roll dice results of one to somebody, probably your uh, leader, right? I guess with his blast pistol hitting on threes, but re-rolling ones is pretty, pretty good. But uh, it's much more delicious to curse your opponent to have to re-roll away all of their sixes. Or a melter gun. Oh, look, I've got a melter gun. Yeah, good. Good luck with that melter gun. Um, you got to re-roll all those hard sixes. Whoops. Yeah, not every team has a weapon like that, but enough of them do. You've then got Hunter. So, so long as the operative doesn't perform mark action, which is explained in a minute, it can perform two shoot actions. If the Razor Wing is selected for one and only one of those shooting attacks. So let's look at the Razor Wing. The Razor Wing, as a shooting attack, is five dice hitting off fours, a one slash two damage, indirect no cover silence. So the Razor Wing, as an attack, is really useful if, if somebody's got somebody that's cowering, Right, that 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 they they've lost some of their wounds. They're carrying around a corner. They're they're hiding on an objective. They're doing whatever you want. You just send your bird. It's indirect and and infinite range. So uh, and no cover and silence. So you just go yeah, yeah. I I attack you. <laughs> I, I genuinely don't care where you are, what you are, what your order is, where you stood. I have indirect. It's the first game thing in the game I've ever seen that has indirect and has not got a range limitation. So you just go, yeah, him. I'm attacking him. This is what I roll. Um, so it's really good for finishing off like wounded guys that have been shot up and are just sort of standing somewhere, maybe on an objective, going, oh, yeah. You've also got your Shard Carbine, which I guess is like a sort of pants sniper rifle. Four dice hitting on threes, two, two, uh, ceaseless, so you're re-rolling ones. Lethal five up, mortal wounds two, so yeah, it's okay. Uh, refined Poison is a thing you can buy this guy if you want to spend three EP on it to make it a three, two weapon. I don't know how worth it that is to you. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, and then the other thing you can do, if you choose not to attack with the Razor Wing, you can do Mark. Now, some content creators have lost their minds over Mark and said, this is the very best version of any kind of revealing thing, except that they've missed something. Select one enemy operative visible to this operative that's not more than circle higher than them until the end of the turning point while that enemy operative is not in cover from heavy terrain, this operative treats it as having an engage order. This operative, the Sky Splinter Assassin. So 
yes, you can reveal someone who's infinitely far away that you have vague visibility to, but only so that you can then shoot them with your shard carbine. That's what's happening here. You're not revealing them for the rest of your team so that then your uh, shredder can pop out and go, ha-ha! That's not, that's not the thing. It's simply so that you can attack them with your shard carbine. He is the Sky Sprinter assassin. He does the assassinating himself with his gun. Unfortunately, his gun is not amazing. Now, there are definitely situations where this model is hilarious. So if you're playing into novitiates and they're doing the thing of going, well, I've got my cup lady and she is on an objective, on conceal, behind a barricade, and she's going to stand there for the whole game, raising and lowering her cup, because I'm pretty sure you're not going to get all the way over here to my home objective to kill her, uh, and there's no and there's no vantage that's overlooking this this point. Well, the Sky Splinter Assassin can pretty much just go, ha 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 ha, I shoot you in the face, you're a seven room sister of battle, I'm pretty sure you're going to die. But against that, against things other than the seven wound model hiding behind a ground level barricade, like, it's not very useful. Um, your mileage may vary. But the thing is, it's hard to hate this model because of the omen ability and the ability to just piss other people off with their snipers. So, yeah, it's fun, it's cool, and when its situations arise, which may not arise every game but the ability to reach out and do you know two three points of damage to somebody that's just over there behind a wall behind a container at the bottom of a filing cabinet the ability to reach out and touch somebody that far away is pretty cool uh and the ability to just go oh you're you're stood behind a barricade on, on ground level and you're like a seven moon model well like decent chance of killing you as well they may not come up you may just be playing against Nurgle legionaries that just run around and rifle stomp you and then you wonder what your Sky Sprinter Assassin is supposed to do with his life but when his song plays he'll dance for you equipment well I've mentioned a lot of the equipment as well uh, so I, I first of all say that Maximum Lazy uh, you know first game stuff I would take Toxic Coating on the Crimson Duelist and the Flayer and Refined Poison on the Heavy Gunner uh, with the Splinter Cannon and the Sky Splinter Assassin. You know that all your equipment points will do things um, because you're just making your stuff better and you don't have to think about anything. You don't have to think about an extra... You've not created an extra thing while you're still learning your team. You've not suddenly gone, oh yeah, and I've got to do a thing with a Plasma Grenade as well. However, we, we should look at the rest of the equipment. I don't rate Chain Snare. Now, I, I, I have to choose my words really wisely here because uh, I've seen other people who are far better players than me go, ooh, Chain Snare. So let's look at Chain Snare. Chain Snare, while only one enemy operative is within engagement range of this operative, that enemy operative is snared. Each time a snared enemy operative will perform four back action, roll 1d6, subtracting one if the enemy operative has a higher wounds characteristic than this operative, and adding one if the enemy operative is injured. On a four up, the enemy operative can't perform that action, but no action points are subtracted. Now, I've said before, when I play, either at home or at tournaments, I'm trying to remember the last time somebody used a fallback action. Maybe this is because I live on, on, on bottom tables. I mean, I, I did quite well at the last tournament I went to. I don't know. Um, I can't remember the last time somebody fell back from me in combat. Maybe top table meta, you know, uh, everybody, you know... Kill team open, everybody's there falling back from each other. It's like a fallback festival. They're all charging without fighting and then falling back and then charging into other people without fighting and then falling back and charging and falling and charging and falling like maniacs. Even if that is your jam, do you really want to trust in this unreliable piece of war gear that relies on a dice roll to actually do anything i'm just thinking of a situation where you kind of you go okay well this model's got a chain snare so i'll 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 uh i'll you know I'll, I'll, I'll spend an ap on this objective or something and then i'll do a charge at this plasma gunner knowing you know i, I don't have the ap to do the fight action but i know that i've got the chain snare so the plasma gunner can't fall back so the plasma gunner's gonna have to fight me and then i'll probably win because he's armed with an Imperial Guardsman's Fist, and I'm armed with a, a giant whip sword 
of of destiny from from Soul Calibur. Um, yes. And then the plasma gun rolls a dice, and then you roll a dice, and then you roll a one, and the plasma gun takes two steps backward and sends you to the warp. Uh, like, are you feeling lucky? Like, I, I just, I couldn't. It's going to be such a high stakes thing when you use it, and then it's not going to work, and then you're going to get shot in the face. Don't rate it. Uh, <coughs> Wicked Blade, one EP. Operative, equipped with array of blades only, add one to that weapon's attacks characteristic for the battle. So, like, the array of blades is the standard thing. If they're not a combat guy, they have this three three attacks, hitting on threes, three, four damage. You can make it four attacks, hitting on threes, three, four damage. Like, it's okay, you know? If you really wanted to, you go nine wicked blades, or whatever. Well, not quite, because you, you get six wicked blades. I just can't see the point. Like... Eh. Eh. It doesn't excite me. Like, mechanically, it might be okay, but... Oh, it just seems like a pointless waste of time. Most of the things that you're going to... And by definition, the things that you've been giving Wicked Blades to don't want to be in combat. And so now you've made them slightly better if they find themselves in combat with somebody else's non-close combat guy. And you've given yourself an edge, and it's like there's better things I want to spend my EP on, like plasma grenades. One of my hottest takes as a person that's not very good at kill team is I don't like frag grenades. This is a punchier frag grenade. Yeah, I, okay, good. Take a plasma grenade, and then if you give your plasma grenade, uh, you know, so if you were starting off with the two refined poisons for three EP each, and the two toxin coatings, and then you ask yourself, will I take the refined poison off the sky splitter assassin? And I'll give a plasma grenade to my basic agent. Is that going to do more for me over the course of the game? You'll have to play better, but probably. You know, if, if nothing else, it gives your basic agent something to do so that he can be heading up the table. You know, this is a very aggressive team. You're going to have your, your leader, your two combat specialists, your uh, grenade and anti-harlequin water pistol guy... And now also a guy with a plasma grenade, all just running forwards like maniacs. It gives your opponent something else to worry about. <coughs> and that's va value. Even if they kill him at that point, that still has value. The phantasm grenade I don't rate. So the phantasm grenade, you select the point on the kill zone within uh, red... Roll a d6 to every operative within blue. Subtract one if they're not visible. On a four up, subtract one from the APL. You can only do it once. And you can point it while we, and you can't point it in a gauge range. It's like, oh, it's a stun grenade. Stun grenades can just go in the bin. I, I just don't rate them. Like, meh. It's limited. You do it once. It's random. You have to get a four. <sighs> Cabalite Banner, 2 EP, and this can only be given to your leader. Cabalite Banner uh, basically makes your leader count as having one extra APL for determining control of an objective marker. Potentially really good. Uh, you know, it means that you can contest it off uh, APL 2 guys by yourself. Oh, and it doesn't just give the leader the benefit. Technically... It gives the benefit to anybody within blue of the leader. So if you've got a center objective you're all fighting over, if you're on an AP, fighting against another APL2 team, if you have two guys there, and they have two guys there, and one of your guys is your leader with a Cabalite Banner, you're going to win. Uh, it's a good piece of war gear, but I just can't... <sighs> what are we not taking to take that? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you don't take your toxin coating on your... Um, the Crimson Duelist, because she's already got Brutal. I have to think that one through. have to think that one through. Right. Ploys. Blade Artists is very good. So, Blade Artists, until the end of the turning, for one CP, until the end of the turning point, melee weapons, friendly hand of the Archon operatives, are equipped with gain rending. Now, we've already seen... A lot of our melee guys like to crit. 
We're already purchasing poison for our two main melee guys that's going to give them critting on a 5+. Plus. And now, right, they're also going to have rending. So we're going to be generating a lot of crits. That's good. <coughs> Excuse me. If I was a professional, I'd edit that out. But, you know. Fleet of Foot. So, Fleet of Foot is not quite as good as it should be. It's 1 CP until the end of the turn. It, when you fall back on normal move, you can immediately perform a free dash action after the action. Or, uh, when you perform a, a dash, you can then perform a free normal move or a free fallback. Um, yeah, it's good. You're probably going to use it every turn. It would be nice if it was just you can perform a free dash during your turn, so you can move, shoot, and dash. You've lost the ability to to do that. You have to move, dash, shoot. Um, but it's still really good. It still gives you a lot of extra mobility. It still makes you a nice fast Eldar. You just have to pay your CP for it. From Darkness Death. Until the end of the turning point, each time a friendly hand of the Archon operative is activated... You can select one enemy operative that friendly operative is not in line of sight of until the end of the activation, the first time that friendly operative fights in combat or makes shooting attack against the enemy operative. In the roll attack dice step of that combat or shooting attack, you can retain one successful normal hit as a critical hit instead. So what that actually says is... Um, if you can see somebody or rather if you can't see some if you're if you as the player see a situation where you're going to attack somebody that you're not currently in line of sight of you can turn this on and then you go aha well when i run around this corner and charge you i'll be able to retain a normal hit as a crit it's quite situational and it relies on the board state being a certain way but I do like it because it can potentially synergize with Blade Artists and with the, the Poison, the, the five up crits, just to really get your absurd numbers of crits. We're looking about rolling off our dice and getting all crits at this point. Now, you're not always going to be able to do it, right? You're going to have to pay a lot of attention to the board state. But it's very, very cool when it kind of comes, when it kind of comes to, to pass. When it comes to pass, yes. Denzians of the night. Now, maybe I'm missing something here. This doesn't seem very good. So until the end of the turning point, while a friendly hand of the Archon Operative has a conceal order, is within blue of your drop zone and is more than red from the active operative. It's always treated as having a conceal order, regardless of any other rules. Now, super conceal is great, and people always lose their shit for super conceal. How much of the game do you want to spend within blue of your drop zone on this team, which, as discussed, I think is a super aggressive team that wants to run forwards all the time? Um, this is basically turn one protection against terrible terrain setups, isn't it? Yeah. You might use it in the first turn if you look at the table and go, oh, <laughs> oh, They've got a plasma gun in their deployment zone on a massive vantage point, and all my guys are behind light cover. Thank you, tournament organizer. I will use Denzians of the Night to be in with a fighting chance, please and thank you. But in general, if the table is set up in a reasonable way, I can't see this being very useful. If I've missed something, do let me know in the comments. I am quite foolish when it comes to playing this game. Right. Tactical ploys. Cruel deception. Use this tactical ploy when a friendly hand of the Archon operative is activated. Until the end of its activation, that operative can perform the fallback action for one as action point to a minimum of zero. I've just explained that I don't fall back very often. But if I did want to fall back, I'd probably want to do it for free. And the nice thing about tactical ploys is that just that as long as you remember you have them, in the one game in 100 when it comes up and you're like, actually, oh, I can do that for free with a ploy. Ha! Fall back. And then do other things, kill you, and then run away. That's the that's the dark hell way, right? <sighs> Devious scheme. Devious scheme is people have lost their mind about this, and it's, it's really good. I don't think it's actually that good. So, devious scheme for one CP. You use the tactical ploy, 
after an opponent used a tactical ploy or a strat ploy. The next time they would use that ploy, they have to spend an additional command point to do so, at which point the effect ends, and you can't use the tactical ploy again until its effect has ended. You are using one of your CP to destroy one of their CP with this. Now, that might be worth it for you, depending on how the game is going. But that's all that you're doing. You're, you're, you know, they use Bolter Discipline, or whatever it might be. I, I, I pick that because Marine players love Bolter Discipline every single turn. They use Bolter Discipline. You use Devious Scheme. You spend a CP. So then they spend an extra CP next turn to do Bolter Discipline. And then you use Devious Scheme. Like, how much CP do you want to invest in just making them waste CP? It just means everyone has less CP. And maybe that plays into your hands somehow. Now, I can see it, potentially, if you're in turn three and you know that you've got more than that and you look at it and you go, he's only got one CP. I'm sick of him doing this thing. Ah, you know, I'll use this. And then I know that it's not going to happen in in turn in turn four or whatever. So now and again it will come up, but it's not something you're going to axiomatically do every time they bring out a signature ploy because you're just burning through your own CP to get them to burn through their CP faster. And that may not actually change the state of the game in your favour. Heinous Arrogance. Use this tactical ploy when it's your turn to activate a ready-friendly operative. You can skip the activation. Heinous Arrogance is hilarious, <laughs> especially if you're playing against Marines, and you're sitting there going, well, I would like you to move all of your Marines before I move all of my guys so I can see where you are so I can shoot you in the face. And then you go, ah, oh, Heinous Arrogance, and make them move two Marines on the run. And you just... Hoping that they give you something to do, right? Like, ah, it's quite cool. I mean, it doesn't come up, it doesn't come up, right? But it's a really cool thing to have. Also, late game, if you've only got, like, two models each or whatever, like, oh, well, heat of arrogance, let's just see, you know? It give you, potentially, in some situations, a leg up. And if it's not beneficial, don't use it and save your CP. Prey on the wounded, again, it's very niche. I would say all these tactical ploys are very niche. So, Prey on the Wounded, use this tactical ploy after rolling attack dice for a combat or shooting attack made by a friendly hand of the Archon Operative. If the target of the first attack, if the target of that attack has half or fewer its wounds remaining in the roll attack dice step of the combat or shooting attack, you can reroll any of your attack dice. So, realistically, this is only useful against like Intercession or Nurgle Marines or something else with a lot of wounds that they're hanging on to. Like, you... You're never going to use this against a 7 or 8 wound team. You're never going to use this against a 7 or 8 wound team. Because if they're on half, you're probably going to kill them anyway. But against an elite team, yeah, that's pretty, pretty legit. Pretty legit. Tac Ops. <coughs> Sorry, what is wrong with my throat? Tac Ops. Um, the Tac Ops suck. Uh, uh, let's go through them. Pay the soul debt. Hand of the Archon Faction Tac Op 1. Reveal this Tac Op the first time a friendly Hand of the Archon operative gains a pain token. Start a soul debt tally, adding once the tally each time a friendly Hand of the Archon operative gains a pain token, including the first time. If your soul debt tally is 7 or more, you score 1 VP. If your soul debt tally is 9 or more, score 1 VP. So to get your 2 VP, you've got to kill 9 people. Or if you're playing against Space Marines, you've got to kill five of them. <sighs> oh. So basically, almost table your opponent and get you two points. Like, it's win more, isn't it? Um, and then you've got, I'm just going to skip over Slave Run. Slave Run is just hilariously bad. Uh, contemptuous Slaughter. At the end of the turning point, if one of any operatives are incapacitated and no friendly hand of the Archon operatives were, you score 1vp, do it again for 1vp. It's not bad. It's not great. It's not bad. It's still win more, right? If you, if you kill someone without them killing one of yours, have a have a vp. Okay. So if you're trying to kill people, if that's what you want to do, you have to ask yourself, would you rather be doing route, rob and ransack or eliminate guards? Or would you rather be doing one of these two? 
Or maybe you want a diverse portfolio, you want to take recon or security, like two from there, and also a killing one, and that could be a way to go. Of the two, maybe Contemptuous Slaughter slightly better? I don't know. I think in my early learning games, it's going to be really interesting not to take these tack ops, but then also to kind of in my head go, would I have scored Pay the Soldier or Contemptuous Slaughter if I had it? And if I find consistently that I'd be scoring one of them, then maybe I will start experimenting with it. Right. Slave run. <sighs> Reveal this tack op the first time an enemy operative is incapacitated. Each time an enemy operative is incapacitated, before it's removed from the kill zone, place one of your slave tokens underneath the operative as close as possible to the centre of its base. Friendly handling the Archon operatives can perform the pickup action on that token while within engagement range of an enemy operative, subtract circle from their movement characteristic while they are carrying it. At the end of the battle, if two or more of your slave tokens are being carried by operatives, you score one VP. If four or more of your slave tokens are being carried by friendly operatives, you gain one VP. Why is this... What? How many ways is this bad? Like, you have to do an extra pickup action. You have to score it at the end of the game. You have to be doing two or four to get the VP. And it slows your move up my circle. I think you could take away the... Like, you could... You could you could make it so that it's... For one VP, it's one. And for, for two VP, it's two. And it would still be bad. Right? You could get rid of the subtract circle and it would still be bad. Um, like, this is the most absurdly bad... I think, could this be the worst faction attack off in the game? Could it? Don't take slave from. Let's just quickly look at the real attack ops that you might want to take. So you've got a choice in all three of what are commonly regarded as the good decks, which is good. Um, maybe you go recon and you go for surge forward. You know, reveal this attack up in any turning point. At the end of any turning point, if the total APL of friendly operatives within red of your opponent's drop zone is four or more, you score one VP. If you achieve the condition at the end of a subsequent turning point, you score one VP. Yeah. You know, this is a team where you've got a lot of guys that want to run forwards. Maybe not on long on 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 short table edges, right? Uh, but otherwise, a potential one. Courier, courier's pretty good. Like it's pretty broken. Like you've got to get a token that can just be a hair over away from the middle line, and you can score it turn one, and all your guys have a free dash. Potentially, courier seems pretty scorable. Uh, sorry, I mean recover item. All the things I just said apply to recover item. Courier is you're you're trying to get over there. You can nominate late game like oh yeah here's the courier and now he's scoring a VP. Yeah, I can see that as well. You know, you want to run over there. You your team wants to run over there, and so scoring your points for running over there is a good thing. Maybe you want to kill. You've got route right. Uh, if an enemy operative is incapacitated by a friendly operative, and that friendly operative is within ready, your opponent's drop zone, so you score a VP, do it again for 2 VP. Again, scorable, scorable with this team, I think. Robin Ransack, uh, you know, reveal this tack off when an enemy operative is incapacitated by a friendly operative within its engagement range. Oops. Within its engagement range, and that friendly operative is more than blue from other friendly operatives. You score one VP. Kill somebody in combat that's not near their friends. Score a VP. Like, yes. Do it at the end of the battle if you achieve the first condition and that friendly operative has not been incapacitated, you get the second VP. Second VP is a bit more dicey, but I think that's quite possible. And then eliminate guards is the good old one when we nominate somebody on an objective and then we kill them uh, and we score a VP. Do that twice. Again, very possible. Or security, you know, you got central control and you got secure center line. You want to run forward. You know what's easier than getting within red of the enemy deployment zone? Getting to the middle, and you do that on the way. Now, whether that makes you kind of loiter in the middle, I don't know. Uh, seize ground is a bit weaker because it's end game storing, scoring. So I don't know how you feel about that. I think to begin with, I'd probably go for recon. Uh, you know, recover items, surge forward. 
possibly courier, although I have bad experiences with courier. Possibly a faction sack of about killing people, even though I said they were awful, but we'll see. Really looking forward to getting some games in with this team. I need to get them painted. I have a little bit of hobby block at the moment. I think I'm a bit under the weather again. I don't know. And the stuff going on in my life. Uh, yeah, and you've probably noticed I'm a bit behind on content creation as well. Uh, <laughs> but hopefully this video has been useful to somebody. It's worth the wait. It's just over an hour in length. I hope you've enjoyed it. Do let me know and give you the, the positive feedback that I require to sustain my fragile mental well-being that would be good uh and also your thoughts and feedback on mistakes that i've made uh you know or, or, the, or not necessarily mistakes that i've made if you don't want to be that negative about it but things that i haven't seen right things the synergies and tricks and things that left out to you that didn't necessarily leap out to me get those in the comments as well and then we can build up more of a resource and just to say thank you to my subscribers and my members and the people who've still been even when I've not been uploading anything for ages now, really, that like, or not regularly anyway, like, thank you for, for sticking with the channel and for, uh, you know, the comments still keep coming. Even on older videos, comments keep coming in and all that sort of stuff. So people are really enjoying the channel, which really, really pleases me. I, I, yes, I'm a really small Kill Team channel, but at the same time, I, I am growing slowly but surely, and that's humbling, it really is. This is just something I do in my spare time. I've got no aspirations to make it like a, a an actual. I don't. I, I'm never going to be a YouTuber. I'm a professional with a full time job. I got a family, got a kid, got everything else. This is just taking up a little bit more of my spirit face, a little bit more of my free time, and for it to be doing as well as it is 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 humbling. So thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you everybody. It is very very late because the only way I've managed to get this recorded is by staying up past my bedtime. Hopefully I get it uploaded before it's officially tomorrow, which will be good. And I hope you enjoyed the video. Have a very good evening slash morning slash whatever it is. There's no time on the internet. Goodbye.